Okay, so from now on, um, we have the same um, routine every week. Um, and this is the type of questions you get. So if you came to class, um, you had to look at the slides. Um, you, sh you should be okay. Okay, let's, we, we, we're just going through a number of examples where I was um, trying to sh um, show to you <coughs> um, how, um, how you basically go about um, uh, changing microstructure by uh, doing uh, thermal treatments. Um, and I'd shown you that, you know, you get uh, very large, even very large forgings are, are um, heat treated uh, routinely. Um, this is another example here um, where we, uh, for instance, look at a, um, a wire rod, yes, a wire rod, the microstructure of wire rod. Um, wire rod is... Um, uh, used to make uh, ball bearings, for instance. Yeah? Not, it's used for many, make many other things, but one of the uses is to make ball bearings. Um, and um, when, when you're making ball bearings, the, the wire rod you make is, is a high carbon wire rod, about a percent uh, or so of um, carbon. So very high uh, amount of carbon. Now, um, usually uh, it's it's not produced, the, the, the ball bearing is, a, when it's used, is a, a very hard uh, material. It's, it's, uh, it's heat treated to make martensite. Uh, but that's not the way you produce it. The way you produce it is, um, is to make a prolytic microstructure. Hmm? Okay, so let's, let's have a look at uh, the way you would, um, you, you would look at this thing. Hmm? So uh, first of all, um, so you always have to consider um, the, the heat treatment, you know, the, the temperature versus time uh, 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 cycle that you consider. Uh, then you have a, a phase diagram, phase diagram for that particular steel. So it, 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 as you can see, it doesn't look like the phase diagram of a regular iron carbon steel because it's that particular uh, wire rod composition contains um, alloying elements. And, um, and then you have a, a transformation diagram, hmm? a, a transformation diagram, um, uh, which is shown here, right? And um, you don't uh, have these uh, uh, the C curves here because it's, it's not a um, TTT diagram, it's a CCT diagram. It's where one where you um, uh, is, um, that is obtained by doing continuous cooling. So this is the one, the type of diagram you want to use if you do continuous cooling. So let's have a look at um, some um, things here. Um, right, so, so uh, you can do um, uh, different things. You can do, uh, and, and we'll, um, we'll have a look at them. Uh, so you can see this is a, a steel that um, when you cool down here, the primary phase that you form will is cementite. Yeah? Is cementite. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the austenite, uh, the austenite transforms, that remains, transforms at this temperature here. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll look at a first um, a transformation here. Mm -hmm. So we, we cool down uh, from... Um, uh, yes, from uh, this temperature, from the high temperature, yes, and then we hold it, yes. So um, this is a linear, a linear um, uh, temperature time uh, curve, right? So when you put this in a, a logarithmic scale, yes. Um, you, you, instead of having a straight line, you get curved line, okay? But it's basically the same uh, cooling pattern as, as, as uh, in both cases. Uh, so I, I cool down from, from high temperature uh, relatively fast, and then I hold for a longer time. And um, so if I look at the transformation diagram here, I can see 
uh, when I do this, uh, well, nothing happens for a while, and then after about, say, 10, uh, 20, 30 seconds, the transformation starts, and the diagram here tells me I'm going to make perlite. Yes? Okay. All right, so let's have a look at uh, uh, a bit more um, detail. So first we, we will do uh, a, a first cycle. We go from this uh, temperature, 1050, and we cool down quickly to room temperature. So what, what, uh, are, what uh, are we expecting in, in normal conditions? So well, we, first of all, we always look at our uh, phase diagram here. So uh, 1050 is somewhere here. So you can see I'm in a homogeneously austenitic range. And then when I cool down quickly, I'm not going to make any transformations except the martensite transformation. Hmm? And the martensite transformation will start at the so-called martensite start temperature, which is around 200 here, yes? And if I continue to cool down to room temperature, I can see um, that I haven't, I'm not leaving this gray band. So the transformation will be partial, yes? Because I didn't cross the, the finish uh, temperature, and, and you know, uh, that uh, the martensite transformation in steels is not time dependent, it's temperature dependent, right? So, I, and as I didn't cross the MS temp MF temperature, I'm going to have a partially uh, transformed microstructure, okay? So now, is this, is this true? Yes, and this is only true if I can show that for this cooling rate of 50 degrees per second, yes, um, in my transformation diagram, I don't cross any of the transformation uh, curves. So this is 50 degrees uh, per second. Again, it's a curved line because it's a logarithmic scale here. Yes? And, and you see that at this uh, uh, cooling rates, I don't cross uh, the perlite and the bainite uh, transformation ranges, so I get uh, martensitic microstructure. So let's have a look. This is a microstructure. Um, so, uh, with the microstructure that's very that's martensitic, is very difficult to see much in the optical microscope. Hmm? So this is what the optical microscope shows you, and this is so you get better view of what's happening in the uh, a uh, uh, in the SEM, which is, and what you see is you see some uh, this white stuff here. And then uh, in between, so here you see what looks like uh, martensite, yes, martensite. And in between the martensite, there is some space here. That's because we have untransformed austenite, yes. And if you notice, also if you look carefully, there are like white dots everywhere, yes. So the white dots, it's not because um, you overetched the sample or, or something. It tells you that these white dots tells you that there are carbides there. So uh, that means, you know that when you form martensite, certainly 1% of carbon, is very high uh, uh, carbon martensite, the, the solubility of carbon in ferrite is zero, almost, at room temperature. So you have a very high supersaturation of carbon. And during the cooling, even during the cooling, the carbon will have a tendency to leave the, uh, at the higher temperatures, uh, to leave the, uh, the martensite. You, the martensite starts to form at, at 200 degrees C. That's already high enough to uh, auto-temper. That means the, 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 the martensite tempers itself. That means, what does it mean? It means carbides precipitate out of the martensite during the cooling. And, and it's very fine, and, but you can see it's everywhere. And, and of course, if you look carefully on the now, it's everywhere. These specks are everywhere, except in this region here. The black region, there's no specks, no, no little dots. And the reason is very simple. The carbon is highly soluble in the austenite. So the, the high carbon uh, uh, content of the austenite um, uh, doesn't lead to precipitation hmm? of carbide. Okay, so let's let's do um, an, another so another cycle. Hmm? Um, we just um, 
keep it for five minutes now, we stop right above in, in this zone here, in this zone. Yes. We cool down and then we keep it at this temperature. So what do I do? Basically, uh, and then I cool down quickly. Yes, I quench. So what do you expect uh, would happen here? Well, uh, well, according to the diagram here, I should make some cementite and at that temperature I should have uh, austenite stable. Yes, so nothing much should happen. And then when I cool down, um, I basically should make martensite. Yes. Okay, let's have a look. And that's indeed what you see. It basically looks the same. Yes. Uh, so I got some, uh, some pruyotectoid cementite at the grain boundaries. And the rest of the microstructure is basically uh, the martensite here <coughs> with a little bit of uh, uh, with uh, the, um, the cementite precipitates. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to I'm going to go lower. I'm going to go lower. I'm just going to go lower. And the uh, transformation diagram here predicts that as I do this, I'm going to start forming perlite. Yes, perlite. This is cycle number three. So let's have a look what happens here. And you can see that, uh, so again, I get uh, these, these black lines or these white lines here in the SEM picture. Uh, those are, this is the primary phase, this is the cementite, uh, pro-eutectoid uh, cementite. And if I look carefully um, at the, the center of the material, uh, I basically uh, don't really see uh, um, perlite. It's, it's at the surface that I see perlite. And the reason is, okay, is because um, the temperature was set at exactly <coughs> the eutectoid temperature, so nothing much should have happened. However, at the surface, it's slightly cooler. Yes, so there I see transformation, but I don't see much. You see, you can see here the cementite. Uh, excuse me, the, the perlite. Okay. So it's, okay. So the, the transformation is partial. But now I go to uh, a temperature that's really nicely lower than the eutectoid temperature, where I have the perlite transformation, that's the cycle of four, and this is what I get. Again, the optical microscope doesn't, uh, pictures doesn't show very much, but if you look in the uh, SEM, you can see the very fine lamellar structure of, of perlite. Okay. So you always need, if you want to know something uh, or predict microstructures, you need to know um, well, first of all, you need to have an exact uh, thermal cycle. Then you need to have an uh, equilibrium uh, phase diagram for that particular composition. And then you also need to have a, um, uh, either a TTT diagram or a C CCT diagram, continuous cooling temperature diagram. Um, yeah, this is a slide. It's on the, in the E-class. It's not very important. It's just, I just wanted to make sure um, everybody knew this. Um, uh, so in the, um, <coughs> in the iron carbon phase diagram, we, we're basically only interested in this part of the diagram, really. Yes? On this, yeah. And, and um, there are very characteristic, there are a number of characteristic temperatures, yes? And that A1 and A3 temperature, yes? So the A1 temperature is the eutectoid temperature, and the A3 temperature is the, the temperature of the transformation here, where uh, pro-eutectoid uh, ferrite forms. The, the, the boundary between the austenite region and the austenite plus ferrite region, okay? Right, now, these temperatures are in this particular uh, phase diagram are equilibrium temperatures, yes? So 
uh, those are the ones that you will observe for the transformation to perlite and the, tr the, the formation of pre-eutectoid ferrite um, if you do very slow uh, processing. In practice, uh, that never happens. You always have a cooling rate or a heating rate, yes? And uh, so that's why we make a difference between AE3, AR3, and AC3, yes? When, I'm, when I cool down quickly, yes, the temperature at which the transformation starts, austenite starts to decompose into ferrite plus austenite, yes, is, is not here, is not here, but is here. It's at a lower temperature. So we, that, that temperature at, that we observe, yes, is called the A. R3 temperature, yes, so the, 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 the temperature where the transformation starts during cooling, yes, at a certain cooling rate. And if I heat up, the same thing, yes, the uh, austenite will, so I will, I will form a fully austenitic microstructure, not at this temperature, but at a slightly higher temperature. Yes. So this, you get an overshoot, as it were. Yeah. Okay. So that that's called the AC3 temperature. Yeah. And so there, so the A3 temperature is not equal to the AC3, AC3 and AR3 temperatures. Yes. Okay. Right. The C comes from the C of chauffage, which is French for heating, and R comes from uh, uh, refroidissement, which is French for cooling. Yeah? So d don't get it confused because obviously the C here isn't the C for cooling. Yeah? It's, the, uh, it's, the, it's the, the French C for heating. Okay? And uh, similarly, the AE1 temperature and this line here, these temperatures here, yes, this A. CM temperature, that's CM stands for cementite, yes? That's the temperature at which cementite precipitates out of uh, austenite, yes? Uh, yes, you, uh, you have a heating and a cooling uh, temperature where this, this uh, line uh, occurs, yes? Uh, well, if we have an A1 and an A3 temperature, do we have an A0 and an A2 temperature? Yes, th th these also exist. But these are, these are uh, magnetic transformations. So there is a magnetic transformation in cementite, that's A0 temperature, and the A2 temperature, w which you probably also never have heard about, but that's the magnetic transformation temperature for ferrite, yes? This is the Curie temperature, yes. The Curie temperature, ferromagnetic, uh, non-magnetic transformation in uh, iron that is dependent on the composition in steels, yes. So that's, that's what you call the A, A2 temperature. Um, also, just uh, for those who d d are not familiar with um, phase diagrams or if you have forgotten how to use it, there's something like the lever rule, uh, which allows you to, to calculate how much uh, um, of each phase is present and what the composition is of each phase. So for instance, we just discussed this 1% uh, ball bearing steel, yes? Um, so at equilibrium, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it looks like there's a lot of perlite in this thing, yes? So, what, but what's the phase fraction? What's the actual amount yes, um, of um, cementite in this microstructure? Hmm? So, so, in order to find this out, you, you, you draw a line um, vertically through the composition, and then you draw a line at the temperature that's of interest to you, which in our case would be room temperature, yes? Through... Um, uh, you, you draw a horizontal line. Hmm? And, and, and so what, what this, uh, the vertical line will cut the, uh, the horizontal line in two segments, yes? This segment and this segment here, okay? 
Okay, so the length you can show, of course, that uh, the fraction of uh, cementite is proportional to this length, and the fraction of ferrite is proportional to this length. And you can also see what, is, what the compositions are. Yes, the carbon content of the ferrite is here, so it's zero. Yes, and the carbon content of the cementite is here, 6.67. So how do I calculate the, uh, the, the fr face fraction of, of cementite? Well, it's basically the ratio of this length, the length of this segment, over the length of this segment. So this, is the seg this segment is 1, because it's 1 uh, weight percent of carbon. And the, uh, this here is the composition of cementite. It's, 6.67, so if you make this ratio, it's 15.15. And for ferrite, it's um, the, the ratio of uh, this length of the um, uh, horizontal line divided by uh, the total length of the horizontal line. So that's, that's 85. And of course, the sum of these two must be one. Uh, so you see that although I, you, know, you do have lots of carbon, uh, the, the, the volume fraction of, of cementite is, is, is not, you know, it's not huge. It's uh, only 15 percent. So, so get it very carefully. The microstructure, as we've seen, can be made 100 percent perlitic, yes, but the phase fraction of cementite is only 15 percent, okay? So this, this slide I, I uh, uploaded just before class here, I uploaded the, the revised um, um, version of the uh, course material. So you, you can just uh, print that particular figure out. So um, let's just say a few, th before we start uh, talking about the effect of some key elements, key alloying elements on uh, phase stability and on kinetics of transformation, let's just say a few things about alloying elements in steel. Um, uh, when you, if you're not familiar with steels and um, you, um, you get the compositions of steels, yes, first time you, uh, I was uh, confronted with steel compositions, um, the, the people in the plant would give me um, you know, sheets of paper with 30 to 40 elements. Yes, analyzed, and um, and so my first feeling was like, my God, this is this is incredible material. You know that you've got to uh, alloy like forty elements, and you know what's the logic behind all of this? Well, one of the reasons you get so many elements when you ask them from people in for in steel plant is because they analyze for these elements. It doesn't mean that. All these elements are actually alloying elements. Many of these elements are just there because they're in the ore, and they end up in the in the ore or in the in the, um, in, the in the basic starting materials, and they end up in in your steel as a consequence. And some elements uh, must be tracked because even though they're not added and their concentration is very low, they may have negative impact on the properties. So they're, all, they're measured. You, you track them as a way to control the quality of your steel. Yes? Uh, so, but, so let's now look at, uh, from the point of view of uh, designing a steel, you know, um, do, we, do we really need the entire um, um, table of Mendeleev to, uh, to understand steels. As, as a matter of fact, no. There are actually quite, uh, uh, relatively few elements that we play with when we make steels. Okay? So I'm, uh, this is what I'm going to try to explain to you. So this t table of um, elements, this is iron, very central place here. Yes? And these are, if, I, if you really look at uh, what's important for steels, uh, this is the, these are the elements that, that are of importance to, uh, to steel. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in, in this set of elements, there are some 
basic, what I would call basic alloying elements, yes? Um, carbon, aluminum, silicon, manganese, and calcium. These, these are elements that are in the steel because we tend to control them. We tend to want to have a certain level of carbon content, aluminum content, silicon, manganese, and calcium. Uh, for diverse reasons. Huh? For instance, calcium um, ends up in the steel because, not because of the properties of the steel, it's because we want to do, it, it comes from the calcium treatments. We, we do calcium treatment to um, uh, give the inclusions, oxide inclusions in the steel, certain properties, so we add the calcium for that reason. Hmm? Uh, aluminum, same thing, is added in many steels, not as an alloying element, but as an element for the deoxidation of your steel. Hmm? So you, you know that you produce steel by, um, in many cases, by um, if, if you worked through the um, um, blast furnace route, yes, you, um, you go from the blast furnace, you go into the oxygen steel making and you blow a lot of uh, pure oxygen on your steel to get rid of the very high le uh, levels of carbon, yes? Okay, so you need, after that, you need to deoxidize, the remove the oxygen that's in solution, yes? You do this with aluminum. That's why the aluminum is in your steel. Um, manganese, silicon, are elements that are always part of the uh, constitution of your, um, of your ores, yeah. the, the minerals that you, where the steels come from. So when you're, you're reducing iron, yeah, you're also reducing, partially reducing the silicates, yes, uh, the manganese oxides that are in the ore. So you always end up with for instance, uh, manganese about a tenth, 0.1 to 0.2 percent of manganese. Yes, so they're always there. Um, uh, these elements also have, we'll see, an impact on the strength. Yes, so they're very commonly used as additions, strengthening additions to to the steel. So, very basic alloy. And of course, the carbon comes both from the reduction of the steel, as, and it can also be used very effectively as an element to strengthen the, the, the steel. Hmm? We'll discuss that in, yeah. Uh, so there are also uh, elements in the steel which we call tramp elements, yes? Elements that end up in the steel because they are in the minerals we make steels with, or they are in the scrap that we use to make steels, if, yes? Um, or uh, they're picked up in the, from the atmosphere, yes? So examples, hydrogen. Hydrogen can come from very many sources. Um, uh, water vapor, oxygen, of course, nitrogen from air, yes? And then we have elements such as copper, phosphorus, sulfur, tin, antimony, lead, bismuth. Uh, these elements are, are very common, uh, for instance, uh, uh, copper is very much used in, in uh, all kinds of wiring, yes? So if by chance you have some wiring has uh, not been removed from your scrap material, it will end up in your steel, yes? Um, so it's a tramp element. You don't, you don't really want them. Uh, they tend to have very negative impact on your properties. You, if you have uh, had material science courses in the past, you probably know that sulfur is very... Uh, in many uh, applications, uh, it has a negative impact on the uh, toughness of steel, so we, we, we don't like these elements. Same for phosphorus. Hmm? Yes. So these are tramp elements. You really wouldn't want them, but, but you have them. Where would the lead come from? From batteries, for instance, yes? Uh, in the scrap, yeah? scrap metal. Hmm? Other, yeah. Then, um, okay, and then we come to elements that we add to steels because we're interested in controlling the transformation, yes? The, the TTT diagram, 
Yeah, that's basically what we want to do. Uh, these elements are boron. We already talked about boron. Nickel, chrome, moly, and uh, manganese. Yeah. So they, they will allow us. We'll see in a moment how, what, they, what for instance, uh, chrome and moly do. Yes? But they will allow us to get some microstructures that would be very difficult to make or to obtain if these elements were not added. There are many reasons why certain elements are added, yes? Um, for instance, if, if I, um, I go back, yeah? So for instance, cr let's just focus here just for a second on chromium, yes? So chromium is an element that I will add to control transformation. Hmm? What I mean here, transformation is a transformation of, of gamma to alpha, huh? or the decomposition reactions, hmm? or, or to bainite. Hmm? But I see here special alloying additions to see. I, I see chrome again here, yes? Uh, what is the meaning? If, if I add a little bit of chrome, I can, uh, chrome will have an impact on the transformation behavior. If I add um, a few percents of chrome, yes, then chrome will start forming carbides very hard carbides, yes? And so we use these carbides of moly, chrome, tungsten, yes? Because they're very hard carbides, they're much harder than cementite, yes? And we will use this to make tool steels, yes? Tool steels with very hard carbide particles, which makes, the, which makes them uh, wear resistance. Uh, we'll see in, uh, in one of the coming lectures that titanium, vanadium, niobium are very often added to high strength steels because they gave me uh, very small precipitates, very small precipitates, and it gave me, also gave me a large volume fraction of very small precipitate. And the amounts we have to add to get this precipitation is not very large, so we call these microalloying additions. Hmm? Cobalt, copper. Uh, copper is, for instance, added to do precipitation hardening. Yes, additions. Yes. Um, lead and sulfur, which I had just said to you, are elements we consider tramp elements. In certain cases, uh, they are added to facilitate machining, yes? In particular, sulfide compounds are used to, uh, so there are situations where you add a lot of sulfur, yes? And um, there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, it improves matter uh, during machining of parts. And we'll talk about this. And uh, phosphorus, again, uh, very often we'll hear people say, well, you know, you don't want any phosphorus because it's an embrittling addition, but there are cases where we do add uh, quite a substantial amount of phosphorus because it has a very high strengthening effect. You, in general, also on the left of uh, iron here, these, these compounds here, titanium, tungsten, niobium, are carbide forming elements. And um, there are uh, certain steels, yes, uh, where uh, complex steels, special steels, where we add very expensive alloying elements such as cobalt, yes. Uh, for instance, mar aging steels are, uh, are such elements. Uh, that's because we want to control the MS temperature, basically, and, and allow us to um, do. Uh, martensitic uh, uh, aging of martensitic steels in, in special conditions hmm, to cobalt. Hmm. Um, what happens if we add a lot of chromium, not um, half a percent or four or five percent, when we add 10 percent and more, yes, we make stainless steels, yes? Then, uh, so in stainless steel, we're not really interested in um, transformation, 
we're not really, in, although it has an impact, of course, we're not really interested in carbide formations. Uh, actually, we, we don't want carbide formation. But we're interested in corrosion protection, yes? Same with molybdenum in stainless steels. We're basically interested in corrosion protection. You probably heard about um, chrome-nickel stainless steels, yes? Um, nickel is added, and nitrogen is not added for corrosion resistance uh, reasons, but to stabilize austenite. Yeah? To, so these are uh, austenitic stainless steels. You, you see nickel. And then again, there are always special steels, yes? Um, w uh, odd steels where uh, you will have uh, a certain element uh, that is very important. Silicon is um, one of those. There is uh, electrical steels are critically dependent on the uh, high silicon content. And it's very interesting because uh, when we'll see this later, uh, when you add very high amounts of silicons to steel, it tends to embrittle the steel a lot. There's a very low toughness, yes? But in, in particular case, if you want to, in particular, when you want to make transformers or uh, uh, motors, um, this loss of toughness is not really uh, that important. Hmm? Uh, the electrical properties are most important. Hmm? And you'll ask yourself, why, why do we add silicon? We add silicon in order to control resistivity in these materials. It's basically um, to not really for the magnetic properties, but for the electrical, the electrical properties that silicon confers to steel. OK, so now let's, um, let's look at um, a handful of um, important elements. Um, Manganese, chrome, moly, silicon, yes. Uh, let's first start with uh, manganese. So, see two things. You all, all, you're always interested in what does a, a, a compound do to the stability of a phase, alpha or gamma, and what does it, what's the effect on the transformation kinetics, okay? That's what, and we're, again, interested in the iron-rich side of the phase diagram. So, okay. So this is the uh, the top line here is the um, the iron-carbon phase diagram. So you can see as I add one percent, two percent manganese, uh, this temperature goes down. The eutectoid temperature goes down. In other words, the austenite stability phase uh, uh, region expands, so we, we call this element a austenite stabilizer. Hmm? Okay, so now let's have a look at the transformations. What, what is the effect of the uh, transformation in 0.9% uh, of carbon? So 0.9% is here, right? So that would be uh, a steel that is almost entirely um, uh, prolytic, yes? So you get, a, in the TTT curve, you get a C, yes, a C, uh, like uh, transformation behavior for perlite. You can see, however, that as you add manganese, the A, remember what this temperature is called, this is the AE1 temperature, decreases, yes, and so, um, the AE1 temperature is, is here. So you can see that as I increase the manganese content, AE1 temperature decreases. Yeah? So the temperature at which the transformation to perlite st starts is decreased. Okay. All right. So manganese does stabilize gamma. And what is more important also when you add manganese to steel, you can do the prolytic transformation at lower temperatures. Yeah? So this is something we often use 
when we want to process steels and we want to refine the microstructure, we, we want to do it at lower temperatures. Yes? Yes, we want to do it at lower temperatures. So this, by adding manganese, I can lower the temperature and have a perlytic transformation at a lower temperature. At lower temperature, we know that the nucleation rates are higher. So high nucleation rates means a lot of small places where uh, things start. Growth rates are not phenomenal, but you get, as a consequence, you get a very much refined microstructure. Okay. Um, all right. So this is what manganese does. Yes. Um, okay. What about silicon? Silicon is another one of these elements uh, uh, that we like to uh, work with. Um, it's, it strengthens my steels, yes. Um, it, it has also an effect on the uh, phase diagram. It increases, it, it, because it's a ferrite stabilizer, it increases the So the AE1 temperature increases as I add silicon. So the reverse of what the manganese does, yes. And the other thing is, uh, so uh, this would be, for instance, the, the, uh, the C curve oops, yeah, for a perlytic steel without silicon or with very little silicon, yes. And now I add 2% of silicon. So first of all, the transformation starts at a higher temperature. Yes? Yes? Yes. And the nose is, is, goes from, from here to here. Okay? So the silicon will um, accelerate, you can see here, accelerate the transformation yeah, because it accelerates the ferrite formation, yes? G and it accelerates this during prolytic transformation, but also whenever you form proeutectoid ferrite. Hmm? So it's a little bit, it, you know, if manganese does, is, is, is the reverse, basically, of what manganese does, yes? Silicon has also another important um, aspect. Uh, uh, which which we uh, use often in uh, when we we do steel design. Yes, um, silicon uh, increases the ac carbon activity in um, in austenite, and so. Um, So, and you can see the, the effect here. So manganese, nickel, not much effect. Silicon, increased carbon activities and phosphorus. Why, why is this important? When, um, I'm sorry, um, I meant ferrite. I just get a bit confused. This should be uh, ferrite up there. Uh, gamma should be alpha. Just noticed this. Um, right, so how does this, um, uh, why is this important? Um, when you, uh, when you have diffusion, yes, diffusion, uh, usually um, you, uh, we think about diffusion as the result of uh, atomic motion in a concentration gradient. So, so for instance, this is carbon, uh, uh, the carbon content uh, at, in this position, one, 
and here the carbon content in position number two. Yeah? So um, if I show you this, you'll say, well, there'll be this, if this is the case, there'll be a flux of atoms from here to here, which is proportional to the, uh, the uh, diffusivity, yeah? and then uh, times, uh, times if this distance is x or delta x, it's, uh, it's delta c over delta x. Yeah? And that's basically fixed law. Yeah? Uh, it's actually not correct. Uh, uh, diffusion is, is the, uh, the result of atomic motion in a uh, free energy gradient. Yes? So it's, the, it's actually what is important is the free energy of carbon in position one and in position two, yes? And, um, and this free energy is a function of the activity of carbon, yeah? Okay? So you know this from this formula, mu is mu zero plus RT ln activity, yeah? Okay, so it's the, it's the free energy that actually is important. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so for instance, what is, what's the effect of increasing the activity of carbon? So f say, for instance, I make cementite, yes, cementite, okay? So when I make a particle of cementite, yes, carbon has to move for this particle to grow, yes? The carbon has to move, there has to be a carbon flux, yes, to the cementite particle, yes? to the cementite particle, then the, the particle can grow, yeah? okay? All right, now say uh, I make cementite. When I make cementite, cementite does not dissolve silicon. So silicon gets expelled out of the region where the cementite is growing, yes? So this region here, yeah? silicon gets expelled, yes? And so what happens? I have a gradient of carbon, concentration gradient that looks like this, yes? Why does it drop next to the precipitate? Well, because the carbon is built into the precipitate, taken away from solution, right, here. Yeah? The silicon, however, goes like this. Why? Because the silicon is expelled out of the carbide. Hmm? Okay, so next to the growing particle, this carbide particle, I have a high silicon content. Yes? And the result is that the carbon activity here, yes, the carbon activity, not the carbon content, increases, yes? And you get a reduced gradient, free energy gradient or activity gradient. And as a consequence, and so the, the silicon content, if the silicon content is high enough, you can suppress formation and growth of cementite, yes? Okay, so you, so silicon can be used to suppress cementite formations in condition where you'd expect cementite to form. Yeah? And this is uh, used, um, can be used to, to good effect, uh, for instance, to make uh, certain types of benetic microstructures. Okay, what about the chromium content? Well, let's have a look. First, what the chromium does to the uh, iron-carbon phase diagram. You can see that on the iron-rich side, there's not much happening. Um, we can see that when we increase the chromium content, there is a tendency for the AE1 temperature to increase. For the uh, eutectoid composition uh, to go this way, uh, upwards and uh, to the left. So it's an element that 
is generally considered to be a, a ferrite stabilizer. Yes? Okay. Let's have an inf um, from, from, from looking at this phase diagram. Yes? Um, let's have a look at what it does to uh, transformation kinetics. Okay? So let's have a look at uh, this particular uh, transformation diagram. It's, a, it's not a TTT diagram, it's a CCT diagram. Mm -hmm. But uh, so you can see at high temperature, I'll have ferrite and perlite transformation. This is the composition of the steel, this particular steel. Uh, it has 0.4 carbon, 1.5 manganese, yes. So without chromium, we get these dashed lines, okay. Right, and the MS temperature is indicated, the AC3 temperature is indicated, and the AC1 temperature is indicated, okay. All right, so let's now have a look at what happens if we add uh, 0.77 mass percent of chrome, yes. You can see here that the, the ferrite uh, perlite uh, transformation is pushed back and the bainite transformation is brought forward, yes? So you get an expansion of the bainite transformation range. Okay. Another thing that is important with, um, well, before I do this, let's, let's just um, first discuss uh, molybdenum, and I'll come back to this slide. Um, uh, molybdenum, in general, will delay the fusional transformations, yes? Uh, that means perlite transformation, typically. And it will have an, uh, a, a big impact on the bainite transformation. In particular, it will expand the bainite transformation range. So, so here you can see an example here uh, of a calculated TTT diagram for a 0.55 carbon steel with 0.8 moly and with 2% moly. And you can see that the bainite transformation is, nose is uh, promoted, the ferrite and the perlite transformation is uh, suppressed. So let's have an example here with this uh, TTT diagram on the next uh, slide. So first, what you see is a uh, 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 iron 0.4 carbon steel. Hmm? Again, AC, AC3, uh, AC1, BS, MS temperatures. So now we have a look at what happens when we add 0.3% of moly, you see the transformation of ferrite and a perlite is very much suppressed, yes? And uh, this allows you to easily make a benetic microstructure. Hmm? Okay. Right. So let me uh, now go back to another thing I wanted to say here. Uh, elements such as manganese and chrome and moly, yes, are elements that uh, uh, can replace iron in cementite, yes, when their concentration is not too high. Chromium and moly are very strong carbide formers. But if their content is small, for instance, like a half a percent, one percent, they will, they will also tend, whenever carbides are formed, to be part of the cementite lattice. Yes? Okay. For instance, here we have, we, we look at TTT diagram for uh, iron, carbon, 1.4% chrome, steel, yes? And you know that when you form perlite, obviously you form, you, you have uh, carbides, yes? In, uh, in the perlite, yes? 
Uh, but when you, for, when you make bainite, you also form small carbides, yes? And um, you can see, you can analyze the content of the carbides, yes? You can, and this is here, this is what we call the partitioning coefficient. You, you look at the ratio of how much carbon is in the uh, carbide, it's how much chrome is in the uh, carbide relative to chrome in the uh, in the ferrite yes and if, um, if if there is more chrome in the uh, pearl in the cementite there has been partitioning or enrichment of that alloying element in the uh, cementite so what you see is that as you in the perlite as you increase the transformation temperature the amount, the, the, or rather the partitioning of chrome to the cementite increases a lot. Yes? When you look at the bainite transformation, there is no enrichment. Yes? And the reason is, during the bainite transformation, substitutional elements do not diffuse. Yes? So they can also not enrich in the carbides. Okay, so, and, and this is what you often observe is that, you know, the, 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 the moly, the chrome, the manganese are also partially present in the carbides. Elements uh, boron, this is the effect of boron on the uh, phase diagram. You can see that even very tiny amounts of boron have, uh, will reduce the size of the uh, austenite stability range, so it's a uh, ferrite stabilizer, yes? The reason why we add boron is because at very, very small amounts of boron, the boron will go and sit at grain boundaries, yes, in the austenite, yes? And when you cool down, for instance, this steel here with 0.16% of carbon, yes, you would expect in normal cases when it's boron-free that the austenite grain boundaries would be the place where ferrite is formed. In the case of boron additions, nothing. Yes, so you can suppress, very effectively suppress ferrite formation in uh, pro-eutectoid steels by the addition of boron hmm? because it, it, it uh, suppresses ferrite nucleation yeah? and you can see this here also on a TTT diagram you see this is a TTT diagram here for a steel that 0.2% um, uh, carbon yes, yes. Uh, so the top one uh, does not contain boron the bottom one has a small amount of boron, and you can see that uh, only the ferrite transformation is delayed. Yeah. Okay? okay? Right, so uh, we'll continue uh, on this topic of uh, composition, effective composition on uh, microstructure and... Uh, uh, on um, next Monday, okay?